having a single person walk around the building, reconstructing it as they go. For example, using something like Kinect Fusion. But in practice, there are all sorts of problems with this, like the camera tracking fails, people wander around in front of your camera, you get tired, and so on. For that reason, we propose a different approach, in which you have multiple people walking around the scene and reconstructing different bits of it that can then be joined to make the overall scene. Faster, easier, and more fun, and the joining of the scenes can be done interactively, allowing all of the users to work in the same shared space and continue contributing to the overall map. So before we look at precisely how this works, let's take a look at some of the existing approaches to dense 3D reconstruction. In practice, there's a bit of a spectrum. At one end, we have low-cost interactive methods like the loop-closing version of Infinitam and Bundle Fusion. These produce results that are like of a decent quality, but the scale tends to be limited to around 50 square meters, and both can be quite computationally intensive. At the other end of the spectrum, we have high-cost offline methods like Matterport 3D and building-scale panorama scanning, for example, using a professional-grade laser rangefinder. These methods tend to produce high-quality results, even at very large scale, but take a long time. So what do we do differently? Well, unlike these existing works, we let multiple agents wander around the environment to construct locally consistent subscenes, and then join up these subscenes to make a globally consistent map. This can be done using relatively low-cost hardware and allows us to reconstruct accurate maps interactively at a much greater scale than was previously the case. So let's dig a bit deeper to see how this works. Initially, multiple, local, multiple mobile agents explore the environment and stream RGBD images with accurate local poses, for example, obtained using visual inertial odometry, to a central server. For each agent, the server reconstructs a subscene and trains a local relocalizer. We use these local relocalizers to find samples of the relative transforms between the subscenes in the background while the collaboration proceeds. We cluster and later blend the samples between each pair of subscenes for robustness. Based on these clusters, we perform pose graph optimization, also in the background, to reconcile the estimated relative transforms between different subscenes, leading to a globally consistent final model. Okay, so having seen how the overall system works, let's dig a bit deeper into some of its components. First up is the interagent relocalization we use to determine the relative poses between the different subscenes. So as mentioned, as we're reconstructing, the server trains a local relocalizer for each subscene. The relocalizer for a subscene takes an RGBD image pair, passes them through a process that predicts a lot of different camera pose hypotheses, and then selects one of these hypotheses to return as the output camera pose in that subscene's coordinate frame. Now what we're trying to do here is to find the relative transforms between the subscenes, i.e. the yellow arrows in the diagram. So remember, we're starting from a situation where none of these arrows exist. To add each arrow, we pick a pair of subscenes, let's call them A and B, and use the local relocalizer we've trained for A to relocalize a frame from B with a known pose in B's coordinate frame. This gives us the pose of the same image in A's coordinate frame, and from that we can then estimate the relative transform between the two. So let's see how this works. First, we choose a pose from the trajectory we use to reconstruct subscene B, and render synthetic color and depth images of subscene B from that pose. We do this rather than using the real images used to reconstruct B, because otherwise we'd have to store all of those real images, which would take a lot of memory. We show in the paper that synthetic images work equally well. Next, we pass the synthetic images to A's relocalizer. This either succeeds, giving us an estimated pose for the RGBD image in A's coordinate frame, or fails, in which case we can try again next iteration. If it succeeds, we further verify the proposed pose by rendering a synthetic depth image of subscene A from that pose. We compare this to the synthetic depth image of B and accept the pose if and only if the mean difference between the two depth images is less than a threshold. So to recap, each successful interagent relocalization of the form we just described allows us to generate one relative transform sample between a pair of subscenes in our world, shown as an arrow in the slide. Over the course of numerous such relocalizations, we will accumulate lots of these samples. Each sample denotes one possibility for the relative transform between two subscenes, but in practice, not all of these samples will be correct. We therefore undertake a series of steps to remove outlying samples and robustly estimate the relative transforms between all of the subscenes. The first step in this process is to cluster and blend similar samples between each pair of subscenes. Having done this, we then first discard all clusters which do not contain at least a threshold number of samples, and then discard all but the biggest remaining cluster, if any, between each pair of subscenes. Finally, we build a pose graph from the remaining edges and minimize the energy shown using Levenberg Markart optimization to determine consistent relative transforms between the subscenes. 
With these determined, the subscenes can then be rendered relative to each other to form a globally consistent scene. Okay, so that's how it works. Now let's take a look at a few of the results of this process. So first of all, how good are the reconstructions in practice? Well, we didn't have a LIDAR available, unfortunately, to get a ground truth reconstruction, but we did have a laser rangefinder. So we took a variety of measurements on the flat subset of our data set, which involved relocalizing four subscenes against each other to make a model of a two-bedroom flat. As the figure shows, the results are pretty encouraging. The purple lines on the figure uh, show the measurements we performed both using the laser rangefinder in the real world and on a combined mesh of our model in MeshLab with the order of rangefinder then mesh. And as you can see, the, the numbers on there are actually pretty close. I don't know whether you can see them clearly or not, but they're pretty close. Um, okay, so what about timings? Um, well, one of the key goals of our approach was to allow multiple users to collaborate interactively to reconstruct a scene. So to test how well this worked, we collaboratively reconstructed an office using four Android clients connected via a Wi-Fi router. Again, the results are pretty encouraging. The time taken to fuse the individual subscenes on the server, as shown by the blue lines on the graph, so like kind of along the bottom, is really low since our fusion engine, Infinitam, is highly efficient. Uh, moreover, since we schedule relocalization attempts between subscenes one at a time in the background, the time taken by those, shown by the green and red lines, is also bounded. As a result, the whole thing runs interactively, even with several agents involved in the collaboration. And if you come along to our demo later on, we can show you this like working in practice. Okay, so si since our approach is also useful for combining multiple subscenes after the fact, we also timed how long it took to reconstruct the four different scenes in our data set, relocalizing individual agents' models against each other offline, and again, the results were pretty good. So here, longest sequence time basically refers to the maximum time for which an individual agent was physically wandering around the scene, bearing in mind that they're reconstructing in parallel, whilst average collaboration time refers to the average time it took over five different runs to join the sequences against each other after the fact. For all scenes, the average total time it took to reconstruct the whole scene was under 20 minutes, which is encouraging for something as large as our lab, which was like roughly 820 square meters. So the final experiment I want to show you relates to the amount of GPU memory our approach uses. To evaluate this, we performed a collaborative reconstruction of the six sequences in the priory subset of our data set, which refers to a three-story house, and examined how much memory was being used both for the subscenes themselves and for the local relocalizers. To minimize the memory usage, we added new subscenes one at a time and deleted the training data used by each local relocalizer once fully trained to save memory. We found that each subscene used around one gigabyte of memory, making that the limiting factor of our system in practice. The local relocalizers were smaller, particularly once we deleted the training data, they were only about 500 megabytes. Okay, so the code for our approach can be found on our project page at the URL shown. We also make public our new data set, the collaborative SLAM data set, uh, to allow other people to test their methods on our scenes. So the data set contains four scenes, um, a two-bedroom flat, uh, a three-story, three-bedroom house, our lab in Oxford, and another two-story, four-bedroom house, each consisting of a number of sequences of posed RGBD frames that can be successfully relocalized against each other using our approach. We also release meshes of the individual scenes transformed into a common coordinate system. Okay, so to round things off, I'd like to show you a couple of videos. The first shows an offline collaborative reconstruction of a three-story house. The second shows an online collaborative reconstruction of part of our lab. Um, so I'll briefly talk you through what's going on in the videos and then uh, take any questions you have at the end. Okay, so for the first video, Initially, one or more users sort of like reconstruct the six overlapping parts of the house uh, using consumer-grade augmented reality smartphones. And so you can see this in the, the small images around the main window. Um, so the images from each smartphone are transferred to the server and reconstructed alongside each other uh, to make a subscene soup, which you can see kind of in the, in the center of the video there. Uh, once all of the house parts have been reconstructed, our interagent relocalization and post-graph optimization process is going to stitch them together to form the final house. Uh, so you can see all of the bits are kind of uh, joining together there. Okay, so if multiple users were reconstructing the different parts of the house in parallel, this process would allow us to reconstruct a globally consistent model of the entire house in under half an hour. So just do a little fly around the house so you can see the model a bit. Okay, so for the second video, uh, we're gonna show two users interactively collaborating to reconstruct part of a research lab. Okay, so as the users move around in the space, their clients stream images over Wi-Fi to the central server, which reconstructs a subscene and trains a local relocalizer for each client. 
Periodically, the server attempts to relocalize one subscene against the other. Um, initially, the two users are exploring different parts of the space, and a confident relocalization between the two subscenes can't be established. Eventually, the second user on the right visits part of the space that has already been visited by the first user. At this point, the server can start determining the relative transform between the two subscenes and establishing a common global frame. So you'll see in a minute that the two different parts of the map will snap together. Okay. Give it a sec. There you go. Uh, so once this has been done, both users can continue to contribute to the overall map, allowing the scene to be reconstructed more quickly than with one user alone. Um, and you should be able to just about see at both ends of that, uh, there's one user reconstructing the map on the left, and there's another user reconstructing the bit of the map on the right, and they're both kind of operating in the same shared space. Okay, um, so uh, that's it, and so thanks for listening, and if you're interested in that, seeing our system in action, uh, please come and visit us again. We have a question over here, if somebody could run a microphone. Is there another question that we can get a microphone ready? Um, how much overlap do you tend to need uh, in order to be able to fuse them in the practical scenes you have, not in theory, but in practice? Yeah. Um, so, so we've got some experiments in the paper showing that. So, I mean, in practice, um, it, it very much depends on the relocalizer you use. So um, the better the relocalizer, the less overlap you need. Um, for ours, we, I mean, because this in, is intended to kind of be an interactive um, sort of like, you know, sort of process for capturing it, you, you tend to um, basically try and get the different users uh, Reconstructing bits which overlap a decent amount, to, so that it, you know, has the best possible chance of <laughs> joining up. Um, but if, I mean, if you, so I can show you. Um, to go back to this slide. Uh, no. Yeah, there it is. Ah, ah, there we go. Um, so this one here, um, the amount of overlap in these ones, there, there was sort of like a, uh, sort of like small office on sort of like the ground floor where some of them overlapped and not much overlap on the rest of it. So that you've kind of got. I don't know, maybe sort of like 10% of the scene, okay, okay. possibly, which was just, overlapping just there on that one. Um, it, yeah, it, it tends to sort of uh, vary. But I mean, it, basically, the way in which the relocalizations are scheduled, it's essentially kind of um, picking sort of random ones from the trajectory. So um, obviously, the more overlap you have, the, the more the quickly it's going to join up. I mean, it will eventually hit all of them, but it'll take longer. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. It was very interesting. I have one question regarding re the relocalization accuracy, success rate, false positive rate. Do you have some numbers on that? Like, for example, um, what's the error rate when you move away from the training set? Yeah, uh, so it's, okay, so we've got some numbers in the paper. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I can, it's probably around, I can bring it up. One sec. Be quick. Yeah, right. Uh, Uh, it's, 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 paper, not okay. it, um, it's in the paper. Okay. Talk, talk to me afterwards. I'll, I can. Yeah. I can. I, will I can show you sure. afterwards. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One last question. Thank you. Uh, great. Great talk. I'm just wondering when the scenes have kind of a lot of repetitive um, rooms. For example, rooms that look the same. Um, are you able to correct um, for kind of um, incorrect relocalizations between the maps? Sorry, but so what, when you've got a lot of ambiguity, as in like the, a lot of similar looking rooms? Yes, so for example, meeting rooms which look largely all the same. Um, so again, it's sort of like it's dependent on the quality of the relocalizer. Um, so it depends how similar the rooms are. I mean, if you really can't tell them apart, 
then there's, there's nothing much you can do. Um, if, if there are sort of like distinguishing features, um, the relocalizer we've got will tend to focus on those to distinguish oh. between them. But um, so, so, I, I mean, yeah, again, like, um, the, so the relocalizer, uh, we've uh, got a separate paper on that, so I can kind of talk to you about that afterwards, maybe. Oh, you, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The question was more on um, basically whether you can recover after an incorrect relocalization. Ah, yeah. In. Okay. So, so, so basically, um, that's the purpose of the um, you know having lots of different samples between the uh, a particular pair of subscenes and then kind of um, clustering them and sort of um, blending the ones in the kind of the best cluster. Um, so that um, gives you some robustness to some in, some of the. Um, you know, sort of incorrect relocalization. So obviously, the better the relocalizer, the fewer incorrect relocalizations you'll have, uh, and the less necessary that will be. Um, but that, that has an extra layer of robustness. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again.